We are delighted to welcome you to this roundtable and to also welcome a formidable panel of experts working at various levels on the issues of gender, climate change, and health at global, regional, national, and local levels. These are issues that we know are now so grounded in good research. At least one study shows that women and children are 14 times more likely to die in a disaster. And we know with climate change, these disasters are on the rise. I think that intersectionality is a critical component when we think about the implications of climate change on health. Um, and so when we think about intersectionality, it's gender, but it's also how gender interacts with age, with occupation, with socioeconomic inequities, and also with pre-existing health conditions. There couldn't be a more urgent time to focus attention on gender inequality, especially within the food systems. Uh, we also need to think about which populations are more vulnerable to shocks and stressors and how we can mitigate potential harm on the most vulnerable social groups. How well do you think we are integrating gender into policies and actions around climate and health? Well, clearly not enough. There are so many strategic reasons to invest in women and actually to accelerate what we need to have done. We cannot address the climate crisis sufficiently if we do not address inequality. We've seen many countries have produced their national adaptation plans. And in this, many of them don't even include health as an area. There's strong evidence that, that climate policies and programs, especially in agriculture, they are not integrating gender, particularly not intersectional social identities. And we will now move on to the second section of our conversation. We will be hearing from experts and civil society leaders working in the Caribbean, Africa, and the Pacific. And we'll learn from what climate vulnerable countries are doing in really practical terms at the grassroots level. I think that while our climate actions may not be broadcast as widely as others, we are not passive observers. The Caribbean Community Climate Change Center now has a gender mainstreaming program which actually integrates gender considerations into climate change programs and projects throughout the Caribbean. It's not a one size, one brush fits all for everybody. We have to understand the uniqueness of the people uh, and the islands as well, which are very different in many cases. Just to give an example on the Gambia, um, we've actually established a, a gender unit within the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change and Natural Resources. So this is actually a very good step because it is ensuring that climate change policies and programs are actually more or less integrated into the work of the ministry. And now we need to shift the conversation to a working session to develop the recommendations that we would like to put before the 13th Women's Affairs Ministerial Meeting on August 21st. Overall, they were asking for the government to, first of all, include them at the tables of discussion. They wanted capital funds from the government to help back them with low interest loans so that they can help to rebuild their small businesses after devastation, um, as we saw with Hurricane Dorian in 2019. Every single voice at this critical conversation matters, and we want to capture as many of those voices as possible. This is going to require decent work for all, including the formalization of informal work that so many women are engaged in and universal access to social protection. Uh, Four billion people around the world don't have full access to social protection, and most of them are women. Gender responsive interventions must be fully integrated into the mainstream functioning of our administrations so that they're subjected to the regular oversight conducted by legislatures. We need to prioritize the access to SRHR. We have to look at the intersectional feminist agenda. When I'm talking about intersectionality, I'm talking about women from all diversities. There must be a global call for enhanced mobilization and access to financial resources, particularly finance coming from those that are historically responsible for the impacts that are being experienced by those that have contributed the least to climate change. And I think the Commonwealth um, plays a critical role in putting up pressure on this. We have to ensure that there must be further disaggregated data collection um, on climate, particularly in the Caribbean, where we know very well there's a sheer lack of fiscal space to be able to collect that data. Women for far too long have been overlooked 
from the local level to the national, even international level. We have seen even with the UNFCCC negotiations, just over 30 percent of delegations actually led by uh, women, which is quite disheartening. And at the local level, we continue to see how women have been excluded. Uh, we all understand women play fundamental roles in our local food systems. They are carers, they are activists, which makes them uniquely placed to drive local climate resilience and food security. I want us to create supportive institutional cultures that value and recognize women's contributions. We're not doing enough. We need to value them, we need to recognize them, and we need to celebrate them. That was wonderful. Thank you. On my end, I'd just like to say that this roundtable has been truly a critical conversation as it's built. Um, as a journalist, it can take a toll reporting on climate change and its impacts. And I've seen firsthand the disproportionate impacts on women, girls, and marginalized communities. And I thank you for doing your part to help integrate gender into climate and health policies.